Hello, everyone, and welcome to Open Expo Virtual Experience to our last day. I hope you have enjoyed it a few days before, and now we're going to start to present the, the speakers of this last day. They are amazing. Let me start introducing you to Santiago Balsaldua. He's teaching computers to program themselves by Copy Nature, and his talk today is about just automatic code creation at scale. Hello, Santiago. Welcome. Hello, Santiago. Can you hear me? Oh, uh, yeah, this was up. Okay. My, the, ah, now everything is on, no? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So, okay, remember, if you want to ask a question to Santiago, you can write it down in the Q&A, or you can write your hand, and then when he finishes with his talk, he will answer all your questions. So, thank you, Santiago. Thank you. And talk soon. Okay. So I start this this presentation is a little bit technical, but it does not require any previous knowledge. So it is accessible to anyone interested in scientific aspects of AI. No need of experience. Hopefully you will find it interesting. OK. So two years ago, in June 2018, I presented the Jazz platform in Open Expo Europe in Madrid. Jazz was designed to be the most efficient possible data storage and processing server. When the project was open source, Hamwa, it was a solution looking for a problem. This phrase was literally used by someone. And of course, we took it as a compliment. We had all this amazing code that gave us the most efficient storage, communications, etc. A single process server application written in C++, uh, an architecture that is just is all you need. By then, just was living its first six months as open source after being released in December 2017 by BBVA. Thanks again. And today, I'm proud to announce that we have found the problem for our solution. And the problem is automated code generation. This means having a computer writing software. Modern computers are built around what is technically known as a von Neumann architecture. According to Marvin Minsky, the father of AI together with McCarthy, this is intended to do automated code generation. And it does, but in a totally different sense. All the programs human writes are different from what the machine executes, but converting one into the other is just a matter of running a, a compiler. What we are talking about when we speak of automated code generation is giving a pro computer some problem and have the computer write the code that solves the problem automatically. This is a very hard AI problem. In fact, the idea that intelligence is about transforming formal into informal is so powerful that it can be used as a definition of intelligence. People have been experimenting with this since the 70s with poor results, at least in the beginning, only recently, the field has started to produce great results. In less than 10 years, we see teams reporting success from companies like Google, Facebook, and Microsoft. So we are proud to say our implementation of Jazz to research automated code generation is also producing great results. So, now I will introduce the problem we have been working on during the recent months. Look at the pictures on the left. This is some kind of intelligence test for machines. What you see is the description of a problem by examples. And like what is usual in machine learning, there are very few examples. Three in this case. The left part is a question and the right part is the answer to that question. 
So watching the first examples, we would somehow identify our idea of gravity. The pieces fall down and stack on top of each other. They cannot rotate or overtake existing pieces. When we look at the second example, we see the same pattern, this time moving to the left. When we look at the third example, it is moving to the right. As humans, we would say, we first identify the pattern related with gravity, and there's only one missing thing. How can we find out what direction it is? We have a closer look, and we notice these red blocks. So every, everything moves to the red block. Good enough. We have found the pattern that explains all the examples. The next thing we have is a new question, this time without an answer. To prove that we are intelligent, we apply the pattern we just found and produce an answer. We submit it to a referee and it gets evaluated. If it's right, we count a point. If not, we get zero points. Then we go to the next problem. Again, we have a set of questions and answers that require a totally new idea. And the questions for which the answer is, is hidden from us. So one after the other, we are given hundreds of problems like this. The hardest part is each problem is created on top of a completely new idea. It is simple to write a little program that solves any of the problems, but the program is not going to solve a different problem. And we are going to get evaluated on problems we have never seen before. For instance, on this one, we have to learn a pattern that uses colors taken from other objects and propagates them along a beam. This requires not just learning the pattern, but the pattern itself has to learn the color it is propagating. So we have hundreds of these intelligence test problems some of them are hard even for humans and generated discussion when this data set was used in a Kaggle competition. We want the computer to just look at a few examples, automatically generate a piece of code that solves all the examples, run the code on the question and produce a solution. This is a really hard problem. First, we have to invent a language that allows us creating programs to solve these problems. But we don't want to invent a language each time. So we create just a set of primitive using the same language, Bebop, the language of jazz, in which we can express somehow between 15 and 20% of all the problems in the ARC data set. As of today, the challenge is too hard to expect a program to generate solutions for all the problems or anywhere near that. And we are not so interested in solving many problems as we are in searching the space efficiently. Know that the algorithm could be solving a completely different problem with exactly the same code, just different primitives. The algorithm does not understand the primitives the way we do. It just uses them to optimize a goal. We can see only 18 solutions were found in this experiment. This seems pretty low, but most of the problems are out of the reach of the primitives. From the set of problems that could be expressed, this is about 50%. And here we can see programs that are automatically generated and solve some of the problems. We had to write some programs manually so that the AI has examples of working programs to learn from. But later, the algorithm writes its own programs using the same primitives, but not the programs in the code base. It is extremely thrilling to see a machine discover solutions we as humans had not found even focus on problems we would consider too hard, sometimes it just gets lucky and finds a solution 
that just works, but is totally unrelated to what a human would expect. Some programs solve all the cases and the final questions. Others get the right solution to the final question by accident. Others think they had found the right solution and that was wrong. And even we have some cases where the program found the right solution, the data set had a different solution, and that was a mistake. So the program corrected the human creator. We could ask the question, how long would it take to a group of monkeys typing at random to write these programs? Like in how long would it take to write the works of Shakespeare? We hear people using the expressions brute force, the age of the universe, the halting problem, even to make the point that it is foolish to even research the question. For now, I just say it just works. It is reproducible and open source. Later we will see we would not even be here if it didn't. We are just made of code. But now we are going to have a closer look of what a big number is, because it is important to get our priorities right. I hope you find it interesting. Let's start with the smallest class of big numbers. If we ask a kid what is a really big number, we can expect something like the number of biscuits in the supermarket. If we ask his parents, we may get the number of bad mites mankind generates in a year. Okay, two perfect examples of the smallest class of big numbers. Class one of seven, the numbers that can be written with 20 digits. Someone provocatively, we are going to classify big numbers in seven classes, beginning with the smallest of all, macroscopic. Take human population, eight billion people, Anything humans can do a million times, take pictures and messages, whatever, is usually referred to as big data. Well, so the upper limit of this class is 10 to the 20. This number is arbitrary, but somehow it points out that most of the problems we tackle are defined by numbers smaller than 20 digits. Some members of the class are, as I said, data generated by mankind. The age of the universe itself, even in seconds. And more importantly for our application, the computing power we can throw at any problem, even if we happen to be Jeff Bezos and have a billion dollar budgets. We will talk about really big numbers. Now it's key to bear in mind, the resources we have to wrestle with them are always small. One euro can buy us five days of computing with an off-the-shelf computer. In the tape, we can see a hypothetical problem that could be evaluated a million times per second. Depending on our hardware and budget, we can explore just a million solutions or a billion times that. But that is still a 20-digit number. The better we do, of course, the less budget we will need. The second class of big numbers is the universe. You would have probably expected this to be the biggest class, but that's how things are. The universe has 10 to the 80 particles. We are not going to talk about that. We're just getting the classes in the right order. So next time you hear there are more possible games of chess than particles in the universe, you can reply, obviously. Any non-trivial combinatorial problem is bigger than the number of particles in the universe. As I just said, the class of combinatorial problems is the third class of our seven classes. Except in the context of code generation, most problems we tackle in computer science belong to this class. This is the class of numbers that have thousand digits, a million digits, a trillion digits, whatever. Sounds scary, but it actually means the decimal system is good enough to describe numbers that size. Back to our Shakespeare writing monkeys, that's a combinatorial problem. Some optimists without much sense of big numbers will say it will take the age of the universe, but now we know better. You know the age of the universe is a small number, ridiculously small. 
Someone who did the numbers and runs a website called The Measure of Things says it occupies 5.6 million bytes in plain text. Now that we know how limited computer resources are compared to the size of the problem, anyone would accept that the monkeys would only get a small number of consecutive error-free characters. Real monkeys, almost nothing. Computer simulated monkey, monkeys, less than 10. Nothing like 5.6 million. Nevertheless, when we do deep learning, we train neural networks with more than 5.6 million parameters. How is that possible? There are two issues here. First, in the case of the monkeys, we are assuming uniform random distribution. While when we talk neural nets, we are using backpropagation, which is extremely efficient. The other thing is there is only one correct solution for the monkeys and a huge number of good enough solutions in deep memory. So to say, in a notion, we are picking any fish, not looking for the only fish in the ocean. So basically, doing machine learning is always about having combinatorial problems that are, by definition, much bigger than the size of the universe, and solving them with very limited resources that fit in a 20 digit number, and most of the times in a 10 digit number. As I said before, these three classes of big numbers are the only classes we should care about when we are not talking about code generation. If we ask a mathematician what a big finite number is, she would probably found out some notation to express numbers that cannot even be written in the decimal system. Mathematic is the science of formal systems. This definition is from Haskell Carey, who inspired functional programming. This class of big numbers, formal, is just what a computer program is, a formal system. And there is a practical limit to automatic code generation. It is called the halting problem. Basically, it says, that we have no way to know what a program will return or if it will return at all, other than running it and waiting for the result. As we have seen, even the age of the universe is small. So by looking at the program, we cannot know if it will return at all. If it does, it may take much longer than the age of the universe. I'll come back to this later, but this is a hard problem. Just to complete the picture, I will mention the other three classes briefly. They are the classes of infinite numbers. You may think all infinite numbers are the same size, infinite, but that's not how it works. Class five is the set of countable numbers. The amazing property of infinite sets is a little bit of infinite is just as big as much more of the same infinite. Anything can be counted. Prime numbers, integers, rationals, they all belong to class five. Class six is the set of real numbers. Again, the same property implies there are the same amount of numbers in interval zero one or any other interval as there are in infinite ND space for a countable infinite n. And finally, class seven is the set of all subsets of real numbers. This is the same as the set of functions from real numbers into real numbers. This also provides a mechanism to define even bigger classes, but I will stop here. Until now, I have introduced a class of combinatorial and formal problems. I told you how they are much bigger than anything material, including the whole universe. Usually, code generation would belong to the class of formal problems. But in our case, I will tell you a simple trick that allows us to do code generation in the class of combinatorial problems. And even in that class, in the manageable part of it, a 50 instruction problem, program that does a lot of things and searching it is like searching a game of golf.
Who invented this trick? Nature. So in a very fast digression, I will tell you in under three minutes how everything happened from the Big Bang to the creation of humans. It's about the origin of code, trust me. In the first place, we have to understand how energy that was available in the beginning of the universe can produce baryonic matter. Let's just say the answer is the Higgs mechanism. It was proposed in the 60s and confirmed experimentally in 2012. 60 years ago, we had no idea how this worked. Then we have to understand how particles end up producing protons. This is particle physics. Again, 70 years ago, we had no ideas. Then we have to understand how these protons and electrons are attracted gravitationally to form stars producing all the elements of the periodic table. This is nuclear physics. 100 years ago, no one knew. Now we have to understand how these atoms form simple molecules, water, methane, ammonia, molecular hydrogen, that's chemistry. 250 years ago, there was no science of matter. Now we have to understand how all the molecules of life were formed to form uh, biomolecules. That's miller urey's experiment, 1952, 70 years ago, no clue. Here comes the origin of code. Now we combine these biomolecules to create sequences of code that produce all the proteins that do all the functions in all the life forms. Single cell to humans. And only once we have code, we have evolution. Some people still use theory of evolution. Well, in the 19th century, when Darwin published The Origins of Species, it was a theory. Since biology became a science and we can sequence every life form, it's not a theory anymore. It's just the way things are. We can trace back the origin of any life form precisely. 200 years ago, it wasn't even a theory. So that's the digression. Now the missing part. I didn't mention when we solved the origin of code generation, because we didn't. That's not a weakness of science. That's the greatness of science. We don't know a thing. We just say, I don't know. 300 years ago, we didn't know any of the things I described. Of course, no one could predict by then when these ideas were going to be understood, just like no one can predict today when the origin of code is going to be solved. It is arguably one of the biggest open questions in science. It is called a biogenesis. Some important ideas here. If creating code automatically was impossible, we would not even exist. And creating code automatically is nowhere as hard as solving a biogenesis. We are not creating code out of nothing. We are creating code out of examples of codes, mutations of code, recombinations of code, all our mechanism nature uses to generate code. Usually, when we think of code, we expect something like the top level example. This is a high level language designed to be used by humans to express complex ideas to be readable and elegant to humans. When we look at code in nature, it looks like something very different. Here we can see a couple of biologically inspired ways to express code. When we speak about the instructions in our DNA, we are translating mechanisms like the one in the right. Code in nature is executed as a sequence just once. This may seem like a strong limitation when we compare it with high level computer code. We do not have conditionals and we do not have jumps, but nature provides mechanisms to replace them. One is inhibition and the other is insertion. Other important ideas that we take from nature are code can stop anytime. Code has structure just like biological code. 
code has primary, secondary, and tertiary structure. We wrote a paper explaining the details that is under review just now. At the end of the talk, I give the address of the GitHub repository where you can find a link to the paper when it's available. So we have reached the moment of putting it all together. When talking about big numbers, I said that in general, code generation is a problem that belongs to the class of formal numbers. In general, this size of problems is much bigger than anything known. We cannot even use the decimal system. Even if the size of a program itself in some notation may not be very big, it can define computations that are impossible in practice. How incredibly complex things can sometimes be expressed in very simple notation is explained by Kolmogorov complexity. It is very interesting from a theoretical point of view, but Kolmogorov complexity cannot be computed. How does nature solve this problem? by just creating code that runs once without conditionals or jumps. Is that a limitation? For expressing ideas, humans find more elegant when written using less symbols? Yes. Result-wise? No. All formal systems are equivalent according to the church Turing thesis. In short, they are all Turing complete. So once we accept some limitations to the language, we can search program in the space of combinatorial problems. The framework that puts all the pieces together is called formal fields. If you're interested, the paper will be the reference. Here are some basic definitions. The language used to solve problems in any AI domain is called BIBO, the language of jazz. We don't want to invent a new language each time we want to solve a new problem. Actually, we really want is to build lifelong learning systems that using only one language to solve all problems in AI, including vision, natural language understanding, speech recognition, etc. Here are some basic ideas. Again, the reference for now is the paper and the just reference in the main just project. Here is a proof of concept implementation. It is a GitHub repository with all the code uh, to build these uh, problems uh, from scratch. The search is done using an algorithm taken from Computer Go, Monte Carlo tree search. But many other algorithms could be used. Modern deep reinforcement learning algorithms such as Mu0 are very good candidates for code generation. To close this presentation, I will summarize some key takeaways. We are thrilled to see intelligence emerge from a machine. This is not new to AI game developers. At some point, the machine you created beats you. Understand the game you have coded much better than you and prove it consistently. This is something that always separates true AI from data analytics. If you just build classifiers, no matter how complex, you don't know the sensation. We are thrilled to have found the problem to our solution and that this problem is so big that it can shape the next year of AI research completely. I haven't explained what other people are doing, but the field is moving fast. We are thrilled to share the implementation as open source software. To try many things fast, what we are sharing now is implemented in Python. Compared to C++, it's like traveling two decades back in terms of CPU performance. The code is clean, fully documented, fully compliant, 
and with a test coverage of 100%. Also, Python ruins the architecture. We just did it in the spirit of failing fast and learning fast. It is startup mode. You implement in Python. If you succeed, you threw everything away and build from scratch in a real language. Concluding, the JAST project is now more important than ever. Now that we have learned, now that we know what we want to implement, we have to do it using the most efficient technology with a decade long vision. This is the third pivot of the JAST project since it is open source. And it is the moment to shape code generation for the years to come. And of course, it will always be open source and we need all the help we can get. So I close here with some slides from our 2018 presentation. The spirit and ambition of the project is as good as it was by then. We also did some improvement in our weaknesses. And again, we need help. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you very much, Santiago, for your presentation. It was really good. If any of you have any questions, you can write in the Q&A. And then I will ask the questions to Santiago. And if you want to come to the stage, you can raise your hand and you can come to the stage and ask directly to him. And if you want to be volunteer, maybe now is the moment to, to ask and interact. And you know, are you going to be here later, Santiago? At the yes, yes, I, I stay here. Oh, that's right, because when, Maybe the people can go to the table and talk to you and ask you the question. Yeah. Now we have 15 minutes for networking. And then you can go mm -hmm. to a table, turn on your camera and your micro, and then you can talk with Santiago and with the rest of the attendees. And you can use it to network. It's really interesting. Mm -hmm. OK, so the subject is uh, pretty technical, I understand. Yeah. but. Uh, I try to give a, a point of view that is uh, not very specific, not for technical people. And uh, well, I hope uh, you understand and you enjoy the the importance of it and and how this is uh, bio inspired. Most of the things we do in AI are bio inspired. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really interesting. I'm not a technical person, and I understood. So I think. It's giving one can understand it. So it was really nice. If no one has a question, do you want to add anything else, Santiago? Anything that you think no, important uh, to remind to the people? I'm open to any questions you have. Oh, we have in the chat something. So maybe it's a question in the general chat. Usually there is a question from Andreas. Oh, yeah, it's a question, but there was not a sign. Thank you. Thank you for letting me know because the chat is with the sign, but the Q&A was not showing it. It says, hello, the references mm -hmm. include comp components, the complete of the components. Sorry. Uh, the references include components, the complete of the components. I I cannot read, so. It says the. Uh, Anyway, uh, well, we, we, we can talk uh, or may, maybe just uh, you can make the question in person. In, in this repository here, uh, this one, and the link was in, uh, you have the, the whole implementation and uh, it is kind of uh, what we have right now. So the, uh, I will, complete it with a, with a paper when the paper is reviewed. And of course, the paper will be available openly. So uh, so the, 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 the main JAST project, I, I, I'm not uh, telling much more, but, but it's uh, more about the technological 
platform to do computing. And the computing we want to do is this thing now implemented in the main just project. So, and the main just project is designed to be maintained over the years. So it has documentation, a manual reference, everything. So as we code, we uh, update the whole documentation. Well, this is more like a one-time thing. We spent uh, four months working in this project and, and this is uh, how it is. It's, it's not going to be maintained. It's, it's just a code that we will use uh, as a proof of concept to create new code in the main project. Okay, great. I think the other question is also the references include the basic components. I think it was together with the other question with Andreas. So you have any other question? I will review the chat and the Q&A just in case. But I don't see anything new. Anyone want to raise a hand and come to the stage to ask anything to Santiago? You can also come to the stage or otherwise we can go to the networking and they can find you there in a table and just chat with you. Okay. So thank you very much, Santiago. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's to have you here. Mm -hmm. So. Okay, so I, I stopped sharing the screen. Huh? <laughs> yes, thank you, Santiago. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so, well, you can enjoy the networking now. You have a little more than 15 minutes. So I hope you enjoy your time and you can chat with the people. You can change to from different tables. You can go also to different rooms and chat with all the attendees. And see you soon here with our next speaker. Bye. Mm -hmm. all right.